Hey, everybody, I'm your host, Eric Mueller, and welcome back to The Eric Mueller Show, the podcast where we explore what makes any successful person dinner clock tick. Have you ever thought about writing a book? Do you have an interest in being an author, but just don't know where to start? Today's guest believes that every person, whether you're an entrepreneur, everybody needs to have a book of their own. She's here to help you tell your story to the world. Aurora Winter is an award-winning, best-selling author, TV producer, media coach, ghostwriter, and a successful serial entrepreneur. She's the creator of the Spoken Author Method and the founder of Same Page Publishing. Check the show notes for links to two of her books, Turn Words Into Wealth and Marketing Fast Track. A free ebook download for Marketing Fast Track is available for anyone listening to this podcast. Aurora left her lucrative career as a TV executive decades ago to become a full-time author, trainer, and entrepreneur. Using storytelling for business, she created a life full of freedom, creativity, and contribution. Now, she gives back and helps her clients turn their words into wealth, wisdom, and wonder. Aurora will help you achieve your goals with greater clarity, certainty, and confidence. Let's head on over to the interview. All right, so welcome back to The Eric Mueller Show, the podcast where we explore what makes any successful person's dinner clock tick. Today's guest of honor is a serial entrepreneur and the best-selling author of the book, Turn Words Into Wealth. Now, if anyone listening has ever had even a sliver of a desire to write a book, you're really going to love what Aurora Winter has to share with you. Aurora, welcome to the show. So great to be on the show with you, Eric. I, I love your podcast. Thank you. I appreciate that. Hopefully, everybody listening feels the same way. So firstly, let's talk about the why behind putting time and effort into crafting a book. Now, your experience has led you to believe that every expert, entrepreneur, and leader needs a book of their own. Why is that, Aurora? Why is that so important that you have that that vehicle to push your, your personal brand, so to speak? There's so many incredibly good reasons to write a book. But one of them is what you're just talking about, to take your brand to the next level. It's like having a degree, like having an MBA. I have an MBA. You've got a degree. People have PhDs or MDs. It just takes your credibility to a whole other level. Like you might know a lot about pharmacology, but unless you have the degree, I'd be a little hesitant, you know, to work with you. So if people want to have a broader platform to speak, to be treated as an expert, then they need to have authority. And what is the root of the word authority? It's author. So by putting in the time to write a book, you clarify your thoughts, you distill the essence of what you would like to say, and then you can share it with others, which is a highly leveraged way to spend your time. Instead of talking to people one-on-one or in a small group or in very short segments on social media, which can bleed all of your time, spend a concerted amount of time, write a book, get it on Amazon, which is the number three search engine, and then your ideal client can find you, fall in love with your humanity, appreciate your expertise. And it's like Match.com for entrepreneurs being on Amazon with a book. It's a a great way to filter and attract the people that you want to work with who want to work with you. All right. Yeah. So so needing needing to start that process, like if someone's listening and thinking, okay, so I I believe I want to write a book. I I think I should write a book because I want to push you know, myself to the next level and be able to connect on an evil, even playing field with, with other people that I'd, you know, look up to in my industry, but I just don't know what to write about. What would you recommend for that person? Maybe they don't particularly love that, that field that they practice in day to day. If you I mean, if you have a medical degree or, or, if, or if you're an MD, maybe you don't want to write about medicine specifically. I mean, what, what would you share with that person to, to find out how to create a topic on, on a book? Well, there are a lot of people like that, Eric, who like they know they want to write a book, but what about? So I think everything should be reverse engineered. This is the MBA part of me speaking, the entrepreneur part of me 
speaking. Um, but let me give a real general tip first that everybody can benefit from, whether or not they want to write a book right now, whether or not they want to know what about, and then I'll give more specific answers for the more ambitious people. So I want to issue a 90-day challenge to all of the listeners. This is something anybody can do, whether you know that you want to write a book or not, this will be valuable to you. This has changed my life. And if you do this, it will change your life too. I promise. If not, hit me up on LinkedIn and complain and you'll get a money back guarantee (laughs) from from this free podcast. (laughs) Uh, But anyway, the first thing is to write every day. It could be as little as five minutes in your journal. Just write every day. Second thing, read every day and read broadly. You know, if you happen to be a a doctor, don't just read medical journals. Read poetry. Read Harry Potter. Read widely. Read crime thrillers. You know, and then the third thing is to once a week review. Review what you've written. Review what you've read and kind of assimilate it a little bit more. And I've found that if if you do this for 90 days, the radical reading, radical writing, and radical review, it is such a great, powerful, easy, fast, accessible, free way to course correct. You will double down on what's working. You'll notice what's working. You'll increase your gratitude. You'll increase your, oh, wow, that was awesome. I'm going to be grateful for that. And you'll also notice what's not working that you want to do less of or things that you're tolerating that you should either handle or dismiss. And so this is a, it's a creative practice that anybody can do. It's a creative habit to read every day, write every day, and once a week, review it. When you do that, you'll probably discover what you want to write a book about. (laughs) But the more MBA strategic answer to that is what, well, if you're an entrepreneur or in any kind of business, what is the problem that you solve? So entrepreneurs solve problems at a profit. If you like the problems that you are solving, or if you anticipate other problems that you would like to solve, a book can be a great way to attract people who have those problems and tell them how to solve it. So a lot of people think, well, if I give my best uh, ideas away in a book, then I won't have any clients. And that's just, it's just not true. So you can give, give, Like my very first published book is called From Heartbreak to Happiness. And I gave everything I could possibly give in that book. I thought, okay, that's it. That's my gift to other grieving people. They're going to be, you know, totally satisfied with that. I'm going back to being a film and television uh, writer producer. But the book brought more people to me because people will always, certain people will always want more and be able to afford more. So if you are the medical doctor who is perhaps interested in uh, segueing out of medicine, as my client, Dr. Greg Hammer, um, is a great doctor in, in Stanford. He has his own business, but he also wanted to give back. So he wrote a book called Gain Without Pain. And it's about gratitude, acceptance, intention, and non-judgment. So that's gain. Uh, some dentists wrote a book to attract clients who needed their high-end services. So reverse engineer it. If you have a prop, if you're an entrepreneur, you're solving problems already. Wouldn't it be great to attract more clients on Amazon by telling people about that solution and then inviting them to play with you or get your VIP help? So because I've got several books on Amazon, I do not have to do the whole social media marketing funnel, get gazillion emails kind of thing. I basically have... Tim Ferriss's model, I have either free or almost free, a book's basically almost free, or very high end. So if you are the kind of person who would prefer to have that kind of a business where you've got free or almost free offers, like free podcasts, free eBooks, very small investment, 20 bucks for a book, or then you deal with VIP clients, then a book is a fantastic, a fantastic, uh, appetizer for people to get to know, like, and trust you. Yeah. And the thought that comes to my mind, and maybe it came to yours as well, for those of you tuning in here is that daily writing. So do you recommend keeping a journal and, and writing, you know, like a notebook and, and handwriting in there? Do you recommend word documents or, or do you recommend something different that, that maybe people haven't even thought of in terms of writing a book? I recommend playing with it and seeing what works for you. When um, my routine is I write every day, but I'm writing various books. But I get up 
have a cup of coffee, don't even have a shower, don't have breakfast, get up, cup of coffee, write. And usually I write for 90 minutes to three hours. And then I start my like regular work day. Okay. So for for me, because I am um, writing my own books, I start off with wh- whatever books I'm writing for myself and uh, madly typing away for a while. But um, my clients, most first-time authors take three and a half years to write a book. Yeah. And that's part of why I do what I do because that was so heavy on my heart. People with great messages, intelligent, smart people, you know, their book could be stillborn or take three and a half years just because they're not word wranglers. And it's a skill. It's like any other skill. Like, you know, you can walk, you can talk, but if you want to be a stand up, you know, you have to practice. <laughs> you have to practice improv. You have to practice to have the, the craft of a, a stand up artist. And it's the same with writing. All of us can talk, all of us can write, but writing a book is um, a big project and it's much more choreographed than you would imagine. A well written book is choreographed like a, like a ballet dance or like ballroom dancing. There's a hidden, uh, or not so hidden if you're aware of the structure, there's a structure that holds it all together that makes it make sense. And um, it takes a while to learn that structure. So for most people I recommend, hey, don't bother becoming an expert in that. Why not work with somebody else? Have somebody interview you, have them ask you the most common questions. So you could even do it by yourself, you could, you know, write down the 12 most common questions that people ask about you or ask about your business. And then you can record the audio of your own answers or better yet have a friend ask you the question or get on a podcast because somebody listening brings out the best. And then you can transcribe that and then you'll have a messy first draft of your book. If you want an even better book, then, you know, work with a ghostwriter or perhaps consider working with somebody like me and my team to make sure that your book is the best it can be. Yeah, I, I love how you you talk about that that transcription uh, piece because obviously we're speaking right now via audio. This you know it's being recorded. We could transcribe it using a program, and and you know I do that for for several of the episodes, and it creates you know that rough. You got to go through and edit it a little bit, and obviously if you're writing a book, you want you know this structure and paragraph format to be perfect, but that probably allows you to produce some content a little bit a little bit quicker and get your ideas out. You know, if, if you sit down and just speak into your, your voice memo on your phone, you know, you might you might talk yourself into some ideas that then allow you to write better. Would you would you think is that a possible strategy too to just kind of spitball your ideas out there and then record them and listen back to them? Yeah, absolutely. Get started. Because once you're engaged in the creative process, more things will flow. So what I do with my clients, we reverse engineer it. Like, what's the point of this book? What do you want to achieve? Do you want to leave a legacy? Is this really for the next generation? Are you trying to launch a movement? Are you trying to attract more clients? Uh, Or maybe you want to write uh, fiction. Like, maybe you want to, like, I'm working with a lawyer and we're writing three crime thrillers. Just for the heck of it. It's for fun. And who knows? Maybe it'll be James Patterson. Step aside. Um, So we're... First, decide what is the goal. And then for a nonfiction book, for example, um, my clients and I will spend a couple of weeks finding out their story, what's unique and special about them, what's unique and special about their business and and the transformation that they provide. And then we'll maybe say, okay, there's 10 chapters to this book. And each one we will do as a separate podcast-like episode. Mm -hmm. So by the the end of it, we've got, say, 10 one-hour podcast episodes. And then we've also got the transcript of those episodes, which are designed to be a book. Um, so each epi- ep- each podcast episode is looking at a different aspect of, of the, um, the content. And so then I take that, the transcripts, my team and I, you know, edit it and polish it. There's quite a bit of editing and polishing because a transcript of a conversation yeah. can be very rambling. But because we've structured it in advance, it's pretty good. But the Number one mistake that first-time authors make is they don't consider how are they going to promote their book. So my clients get, you know, 10 hours or so of audio and video content. So that gives them maybe the start of their podcast, perhaps 10 podcast episodes. But we can slice and dice each of those video or audio pieces as well as slice and dice the text to create hundreds of pieces of social media video, audio, and text content so that when they're ready to launch their book or when I launch it for them, um, we have got hundreds of pieces. 
to launch them. And they're already ready to be interviewed by other podcast hosts because they've already done it. They've got the drill. They've got the media training. So it's like media training plus a bunch of social media content. Plus you also get a book plus part of it's therapy too. You discover who you are and what is it, what matters to you and what you really want to share. Yeah, I think, yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I, I, it's a passion of mine to, I, I have a passion to write a book, but oh, cool. obviously I haven't started yet. So I think a, a big thing and, and a, a previous guest on this show, and it just sticks so clear in my mind every time I think of something like this, is it was Ben Whiting, an earlier guest, and he said, done is better than perfect. Mm -hmm. And that's, it, it's so short and sweet, but it's so powerful because I think that's what's, that's what, what's prohibiting me from writing this book is I want to do it so well, or I want to get, you know, I really want these ideas to be clear and, and I'm not certain on, you know, fiction or nonfiction. I've got kind of an idea for both. But I'm guessing I'm guessing some of the listeners feel the same. Like they they probably feel like it would be really nice to have a book produced with my name on it right now as a marketing tool for myself. But they but they haven't done it yet. So I yeah. think you know that writer's block, so to speak. What have you found with working with your clients? Like, have you found them to have that same problem, or is it because you habitually get it in their mind that they're doing it every day? Do, do they break it so early? Oh my God. I'm so glad you asked this question, Eric. And, and I talk about imposter syndrome in my book, Turn Words Into Wealth. Everybody's got imposter syndrome. It's not unique and it's okay. But the only way to make a good book or a great book is to start writing or to start creating or to start the engaging with the process. It's like if you, if you set the bar so high and you say, oh, I want to run a marathon and I want to finish the Boston Marathon first, but you're not willing to run around the block. <laughs> that's yeah, what we that's... do to ourselves in so many different, in so many different aspects. So I specialize, my company, Same Page Publishing, we specialize in best-selling award-winning books. And since I launched that at the pan at the pandemic, all of my clients have been best-selling award-winning authors. So there, yes, you need to show up and you need to do the work, but there's also a structure and a strategy behind it. So pretty much if I accept somebody as a client, they're going to get a best-selling award-winning book. Now, it may not be a Pulitzer Prize winning book, but it's going to be good and it will do the job that it's set out to do. So whenever we, we have that imposter syndrome or whenever we are stopped by the idea that we want it to be perfect, harness that energy to pull you forward and acknowledge how wonderful it is that you want to be great. But then you need to push yourself from behind as well. Otherwise, it will stop you. And the pushing from behind comes from, you don't even know if you're going to be alive tomorrow, Eric, and neither yeah. do I. Very neither true. do I, right? So the project that's half done can be can be stillborn. It can never come out. Don't die with your music inside of you. Don't die with your book inside you. And don't think of it as one book. Think of it as a series of books or a series of podcasts or a series of whatever that you're up to. And allow yourself to grow and maybe read the book Mindset. It's a good book, right? When we have a fixed mindset, then we think that we've got to be perfect the first time out the gate and that failure means that we are a failure. When we have a growth mindset, we realize that, hey, if we fail, that just means we didn't learn that skill yet and we need to double down. We need to learn. We need to be willing to um, be thought imperfect. I'm taking improv classes now through oh. Second City. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So if you want to improve, be be willing to be thought, you know, imperfect. This is, I'm practicing this. I'm practicing what I preach. So how does that land with you? And do you think you could get over whatever's got you stalled about writing your book? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, I think, you know, a thought that comes to my mind too from this and this is a, another, you know, guest from the podcast. And that's, I think, as a testament to my listeners here, really this creative project of my podcast has taught me so much about myself just by mm. doing it and by consistently getting it done and, and not not having the writer's block with it. So I think I can use some of what I learned with this to, to do that. But a previous guest that I had as well, they had brought up the point that it's, it's Parkinson's law is, is the law that the amount of time or, or space that you give something, yeah. that's the amount that you'll take. And and that, yeah. that again, struck so so home with me because if someone gives you six months to complete a project, 
maybe not everybody is going to take that long, but most of you listening know, like you're, you're going to procrastinate. It's going to be yeah. five and a half months and you're going to start it and you're going to hope to cram it in the end. And I think that if I can not do that, if I can maybe put a time frame on, on the book and, and get like, okay, I, I will get it done in three months, but I can combat that procrastination by writing every day. And you're not the first one to have said that to me as advice from a, from a book standpoint is that you got to put your butt in that seat and write each and every day and you can't get distracted. And yeah, so I think, I mean, I think using the tools you've, you've taught here so far, I think so. But mm-hmm. until I, until I put that, that work in and do it, you know, I'll have to see it to, be, to believe it myself. Well, I also know you're a competitive runner and even though writing is typically considered a solitary task, having a writing buddy can really help you. You know, I did NaNoWriMo, which is a, in November, a challenge to write a book in a month. So, you know, every day I was texting my writing buddy, you know, how many pages did you write or how many words did you write and did you write today? And, you know, that was that was fun. And or you can work with somebody like myself, who's like a coach. You'd be talking to me every week. And every week, we're going to be making progress on your book, whether you like it or not. Well, you will like it. It's it's fun. It, it's the, the thought that's stopping you, not the actual. It's not you specifically. Most people are stopped just by the idea of it. But once you get into it, it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you got to, I feel like you got to fall in love with it, probably. Like to equate it to running. You know, when, when I was at my peak of training and I hope to get maybe exceed the peak in the future here, but when I was at the, the current peak, you know, I was really in love with doing it each and every yeah. day. And I, and I, the days that I, that I wouldn't run, if it was not a planned off day, it would feel weird. So to yeah. get that, build that habit kind of comes back to that habit piece you shared with, with uh, yeah. doing that. And, you know, another book that has been recommended to me numerous times is Atomic Habits. I don't know if you've read that one. I love that book. Yeah. Awesome book. Really great. Yeah. The, the, the lessons of just being able to, to make those habits easy, make the bad habits more difficult. And it's it's easier said than done, but putting it into practice, you know, if you, if you just kind of play with it and, and make it your own, I feel like you can see some results with it. Well, absolutely. And that's why I write every day. Well, every weekday, sometimes I don't do Saturday and Sunday, uh, but it's easier if I just do every day. And my rule with myself is I turn on my computer, I open up Scrivener, the program I write in, and it's okay if I only write the date and, oh my God, you know, I'm going skiing and I have to leave. It's like, you know, the bus, you know, my brother's taking me and uh, friends up at 6, 6.30 and it's 6.15. So I got to get my ski gear on. If I write that, that's fine. That counts. Right. But mo- most times when I get writing, I don't want to stop and I could write, you know, eight hours. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think too, with, with that is that even if you just write that date, like, like working out, equating it to working out, I'm Exactly. Sure, I'm sure everyone can, can understand that, you know, when you do a workout, you're probably not going to feel a hundred percent every time. But yeah. if you go to the gym and put your shoes on and go there, and, and if you only get through two of your workout sets instead of the 10 you'd planned, that's still way better than having not done it at all. So I think it's, you're still, you still have that habit in your mind. So I, exactly. I love that. Piece. That's I why love I love that. this 90 day challenge. If people can, uh, if people really want to write a book or, or, uh, become more creative then the 90 day challenge, write every day, read every day and review once a week, do that for 90 days. Your life will absolutely be transformed. And the other thing is writing is a way of thinking. Speaking to somebody who's listening attentively as, you know, we are to each other is another way of thinking and discovering things. But writing is another way to discover who you are and what matters to you and where are you going anyway. So it's like, you know, you just got married. If you didn't speak to your wife for five minutes each day, you wouldn't have a very good marriage. I mean, you got to talk to her for at least five minutes a day. What about carving out at least five minutes to just talk to yourself. That's what I think journaling can do. And you are important. Every person is important. It's worth some small amount of time to have the habit of getting to know this wonderful person that you are a little bit better. Yeah. And Aurora, so you can, you can write a book and you can get it completed and have it and have it fully written. Maybe you're in the process of editing. So that, that is a a measurable thing that you can do. Exactly. But I, I think what, what I've found in, in, in talking to people on this show is that they all, they all talk about success and measure it differently. 
So I'm, I'm curious to find out what your definition of success is. So maybe, maybe it has a, a metric on it. Maybe you're like, Hey, to be successful, you have at least published one book. Let's quantify that. And, and then everything else is, is just icing on the top. But so what, what would you, what would you say success means to you? I love that you asked this question and I found the answers your other guests gave also very interesting. I define success not as a goal, but as a process. It's the process of working towards something you find meaningful. So success is an engaged process, not a result. And I think when people think it's a result, they can they can miss the mark or become unhappy. For me, I define that as, you know, becoming the best I can be, mastery. And mastery for me has three legs, creativity, connection, and contribution. So those are my three touch points. If I feel off balance, I write every day. So creativity is usually a checkpoint, but maybe I haven't contributed enough, or maybe I've been too much of a hermit. That's been easy to do through the COVID pandemic, not connecting enough. So creativity, connection, and contribution. And those are the legs that, that keep me on my path. And so you have, we, we could think of it as a table. So you have those legs that are, that are shaping what success is to you. So that top of the table. So what is it that, that gets you to to put that table in a room, so to speak, to, to keep you driven towards that success. Do you have any driving forces that you can you, you easily come to mind that, that you have in the forefront of your mind each and every day? I think uh, it's partly personality. I am a driven person, as you are, type A personality. But for me, it is this elusive goal of mastery. And, and for me, I'm very interested in all kinds of communication. From, you know, from books to stand up, my backgrounds as a film and television writer producer. Um, I think entrepreneurship is also very creative, pitching, TEDx talks, raising capital, all of these are forms of communication. And there's nothing more high leverage than communication. Being able to communicate and inspire and connect with others is an asset, but most people don't think of it as an asset. They take it for granted. But Steve Jobs, for example, he practiced for three weeks before Apple launches. Why would a busy CEO practice for three weeks? Well, because it was worth it. But most people don't allocate that time. They don't understand how important it is. So for I want to master communication, which is an impossible goal. I will never master it, but I can make progress towards a worthy goal. And then my secondary goal, the one rate relating to contribution and connection, is launching thought leaders and helping other extraordinary leaders and movers and shakers and people who want to make a difference like yourself, Eric, helping them distill their message so that other people can benefit, whether they're speaking on the TED stage or on a podcast or it's in a book or it's on social media videos. So because I think as I help others express what's inside of them more clearly and articulately, you know, it helps the world. So that's what I'm about. All right. Yeah, what drives it. you? What drives you? I think what drives me is, is really the people that, that I care about. And, you know, my family, friends, wife, my dog. Mm -hmm. I, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm happy you asked because really I, I, have, I have learned a lot about, like I'd mentioned earlier, I've learned a lot about myself interviewing the, you know, these wonderful individuals on the Eric Mueller show. And Learning what, what success means to them helps shape my definition. Hopefully it's helped shape yours as well for, for those of you out there in the audience. And that question about, yeah, what keeps you driven? You know, really the, the whole point of this podcast is what keeps successful people driven? Because there's, it's like, there's got to be a secret sauce. There's got to be something. But each and every time it, it, you know, it's just simply laid out. Here it is. And, and I think those, those answers that, that people share, like the one you just shared there is, is, it's, it's easy to apply, you know, when you think about how does this apply to my own life? It's, it's probably pretty easy to think about what drives you. And at the beginning, I thought, I thought it'd probably be pretty tough for me to think of it. But yeah, mm -hmm. you ask the question, the very first thing that comes to my mind is, is to my family and people that I care about and financial independence and financial freedom. I so am so passionate about chasing that in order to have more time with those people. Mm. And has your definition of success or what drives you shifted over the course of doing your podcast? How, and if it has shifted, how has it shifted? I would say, yeah, I would say it has, I would say success when, when I first started, it was, it was certainly tied to, to metrics or, or accolades, you know, a, a certain position or title, a certain amount of money, 
you know, a certain salary per year, so to speak, that that was, you know, a successful person. It's like, wow, that person's worth X amount of dollars. Mm -hmm. And I think now it's it's shifted from knowing that that, you know, there's a lot of factors that go into what can get someone to that level, if that is your goal. But it's it's the journey along the way. It's that climb to that that really is what people on the show have shared about what what success is. And it's really yeah. not that you get to the pot of gold at the end, but it's it's what shaped you along the way. So I think that my definition now really is I got to be patient. And I got to enjoy this ride. And it's, it's tough, <laughs> you know, you ambitious individuals out there. I'm sure you, I'm sure you feel the same way. It's, it's hard. And it, I don't know if you like Gary Vaynerchuk, but he is, is a He's pretty great. big, pretty big thought leader. He's pretty cool entrepreneur. And he is so big on, on patience and gratitude. And I see things yeah. he posts and he, he really, he, it, it rains me in a little bit when he posts things about like, you know, patience is the way to get to your ambitions. Whereas it seems like some people think being patient, you know, it's like you're being lazy. What are you doing? You know, you got to, you got to rise and grind and you got to get there. But yeah, I, I think <laughs> I, I appreciate like you a, asking. I like a, a, a line from the book, A Course in Miracles, which is infinite patience produces immediate results. Wow. I know. I'm Powerful. not patient. So I really, need, I needed to put that on the dashboard of my car at one point. Infinite yeah. patience produces immediate results. I want to say one more thing about success, which is that my husband died when he was three years older than you are. Oh my gosh. So he was 33 and our son was four. Wow. And we had a multi-million dollar business. We had a lot of financial success, but the biggest payday I got was when I got the life insurance money. Mm -hmm. And that was the worst day of my life. If you think money is going to make you happy, that is so wrong. Money is one very shallow metric for one thing that matters. And studies about happiness, I studied happiness. Um, Eric, Eric, or is it Edward Diner? Anyway, he wrote the book Happiness. Um, and he and his son did a whole bunch of research. Once people have made about $75,000 US for the living in the States, the incremental value or additional value or marginal value for extra money is very slight. So the difference in happiness between somebody who's making 75K in the US or 300K is very little. So I would really invite listeners, you know, we've just been through the pandemic. So many things matter besides money, like being able to travel, being able to see your friends, being, being healthy. And, and, you know, being able to have a dog and get married and have a podcast and be engaged with other interesting people. See if you can make the metrics for your life more than money. And also, you if you really dig down into the people who are bragging about making seven figures or make the Forbes 100 or 5,000 list, Inc. Inc. 500, is it? Um, lots of them share, oh, yeah, I grew really fast and my company did $8 million, but that was the same year that I, my company lost net $500,000. So don't be dazzled by the gross figures. Instead, see what, you know, what really provides joy and how can you leave a lasting legacy and enjoy your life? Wonderfully stated. And yeah, I mean, I think, you know, great point there too about sales. I mean, just $100 million in sales doesn't mean any profit. You yeah. know, if you, you don't have to watch much Shark Tank to know that it, it's <laughs> it's it's crazy. But I think when when you when you pursue entrepreneurship and you know you help individuals from from a variety of fields write books and get and you know, tell their story, which I think that's so inspirational that you can provide that that vehicle to to share the stories that people need to hear. They they may not even realize they need to hear a story that someone has until it's told to them. Yeah. So I think that I think that's wonderful. But what what have you noticed with with the various people that you've worked with as far as the the common traits of of the ones that that do create like a big project you know they they gain a lot of market attention is there any are there any similar traits to those people or or is there does it just kind of come down to that hard work and, and opportunity kind of just meeting you know it's it some some might call that luck in a way and you you might need a little bit of that to to explode on the scene so to speak you know what's kind of shocked me Eric and I think you and I are fairly similar in terms of of our personality types um I was shocked to realize not not that many people are actually driven not that many people actually are willing to take risks not that many people are willing to work that hard 
a lot of people are um, happy to play in a different way. And that's okay, because we need different people. So the what I've noticed about my clients who have, you know, raised eight figures or that kind of thing is they're super ambitious. They're really driven. They're unstoppable. If they come off across a problem, they expect to come across a bunch of problems. They pride themselves on solving problems. They're like, you know, I'm the knight of problem solving. Mm-hmm. And that's my thing. So I give myself, you know, a lot of... Uh, a credit for solving problems as opposed to being devastated that there are problems. And they think of themselves as heroes, you know, who may have bumped along the way, but who can make the world a better place. Like, I think that people who, who I know, my clients, I, they, they, there's a, a flavor of destined for greatness, mm-hmm. which can also create a bit of impatience because you know you're destined for greatness. You know that you're meant to make, make a bigger difference in the world, but you're maybe still in the process of finding that. So um, that's what I notice about the people who really hit it out of the park. What about you? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, in the the CEOs and people that have, you know, from an earlier definition of, of success for me, people that have, you know, reached that that level, they're, they're a CEO or they, they are a founder of a company that's gone public. I think that I think that those people really do share that patience piece that we talked about just a little bit ago. Mm -hmm. And they really, they, they let the opportunities come to them and they don't, you know, they may, they kind of keep that balance between being ambitious and being patient, which that's really inspiring to, to strive for. I, I don't, I know that I'm not there yet. I should say I need to work on that. And, and I think it probably resonates with other, other people that, that feel the same way is that, you know, you do not want to lose your ambition, but you got to take it easy on yourself at some point too. You don't want to burn out and, and feel like a failure, even though you've, you've, you've gained some success, but you know, maybe we maybe we just can't measure success too much by that pot of gold at the end anymore. Oh, you'll really like this. I just finished reading the or listening to the audiobook Dopamine Nation by Anna Lemke. See if you can get her on as a guest. Dopamine Nation is the book. Because huh. um, it could just change how you think about success, 180 degrees. And I first heard about her book because she was on uh, Impact Theory podcast with Tom Bilya. And the dopamine is a hormone uh, it's kind of the hormone of achievement. So it's, it's when you're going after something, you, you get flooded with dopamine and it's a feel good chemical. So Tom, who's running a very successful company said that how he organizes his life and his business is to reward himself for going after something, always being on the quest, driving for something and not rewarding himself when he gets it. Uh, achieving any goal is like sex, Right. There's the 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 um, the buildup, the seduction, the erotic buildup, and then there's the climax after which you go to sleep. <laughs> so, mm. so the best entrepreneurs or the best creative people extend the joy of the pursuit rather than focusing on the 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 climax of the achieving the goal or the whatever. <laughs> Yeah. So, and it's dopamine that we get when we are actively pursuing goals that are meaningful to us. And in fact, do- books are a dopamine delivery device. Aha! For those of you super advanced in the audience, dopamine can be released through through good, well written books, whether they help you achieve your goal or whether they're um, Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> yeah. No, that, I mean, that's a very interesting way to think of it in, in terms of that, you know, that journey and, 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 and being able to enjoy the ride towards a goal. I think that's, that's something that I, I think most people probably could work on Yeah, because it's, you would think if you have a goal of owning a Ferrari, for example, let's just, let's just put a material thing to it. You probably don't get much enjoyment out of not having a Ferrari right now, if that's really what you want. But maybe you should try to get some enjoyment out of what it takes to get you there. And maybe you won't feel that dopamine when you actually finally get that car. In fact, you probably won't. And I don't own a Ferrari and I I have, you know, a dream to have a sports car. But I'm curious, you know, when you actually achieve a monetary or a, a material goal, let's say, that can be tied to a monetary thing. But when you actually achieve that, you you may find that the feeling you have is way different than you thought. Is is that I mean it's kind of kind of related to what you just talked about. It, it, 
Yeah, most people think it's about achieving the goal. It's about getting the Ferrari. But my experience and also the neuroscience of how people actually work is that what's great about having a goal is who it invites you to become and who you choose to become along that journey. And as soon as you achieve a goal, celebrate. You'll probably feel great for 24 hours. <laughs> yeah. But then set yourself another goal that probably take you six months to get there, right? So, you know, you want to uh, win a marathon. How many months do you train versus how long is that one race, right? And then you won or you didn't, right? It, but it, we set ourselves, we can enjoy life so much more if we appreciate the journey, the quest. We are all heroes. We're all like kind of knights. I wouldn't say we're damsels in distress. I'm not sure what the maiden equivalent of knight is. But anyway, we are knights on a heroic quest to become the best person we can be, to slay the dragons and to rescue whatever damsels or young men need rescuing on the way. And, you know, when it's over, that's that's good. Have a celebration, but then choose another quest, choose another goal, because we can learn so much over life. We can contribute so many, so many different things. I've had so many different chapters in my life and everyone can do that too, if they want to. Now, a thought that came to my head right now in terms of the, the book space and, and someone that has you know a desire to write a book, someone that wants to be an author, is there a topic, either nonfiction or fiction, that you haven't seen yet that you think needs to be written? Is there, could we prime the audience a little bit here? Is there anything that just comes to your mind that, you know, you think it could be useful, but you haven't seen it done yet, at least in your own personal experience? Ah, uh, I love this question. One of the weird things about me is that I'm a creative person. I am a writer. I have this film and television background, but I've also got this MBA thing. So I love data. So with each client, I look at their area of expertise, and then I have the data about what is selling on Amazon right now in that uh, bullseye adjacent to it, like where are the hot niches, where are things slow, what's an oversaturated market. And there are many little niches that ha are underserved where a book with a very small marketing budget of, say, a few thousand dollars can, can hit it out of the park. Whereas if you choose the wrong niche, like you couldn't hit it out of the park, even if you had a million dollar of advertising budget. So I don't have um, an answer, one size fits all answer, because I don't think you can write just any book or that would that would be a different kind of business. I do know somebody who does that, who just looks at that and then hires a ghostwriter to write a book to fit that niche. And his last ghostwritten book was about Python mm -hmm. software coding, which I'm not interested in helping people write books about things I have no knowledge about. <laughs> but yes, there are little pockets. So we, you know, f um, you know, we should look for you. What are you interested in? And what are the little pockets, you know, relating to law, relating to ambition, relating to goal setting, relating to success, relating to pharmacology, relating to, I don't know, um, running marathons that may be underserved? What are some problems? Basically, what are problems that you can solve that people are right now looking for on Amazon, that there aren't thousands of other books about it? And that could be a great book to start with. Yeah, I, th I think a good piece of homework for the audience just as we close the interview is is maybe just think of and write down like three topics or ideas of things that you are passionate about. Because as I'm thinking right now, things that you're passionate about it's probably going to be easier to write about it. And, and I'm thinking you might agree with that, Aurora. But I would say if you can do that and write those down, that might prime you. Curious about. Write yeah. about things that you're curious about because that's the kind of passion that you need to write a book. You, you, it's very helpful if you want to know more about it. Like you're, you're curious. Yeah. yeah. The curious kind of passion. Exactly right. Yes. Write down yeah, three things. Things you want to research more about and, and, and be able to, you know, you're going to learn along the way too. And that's probably going to bring out something in the book that you'll have a unique perspective on it if you're, if you have that curious passion. So yeah, exactly I, pre right. I appreciate, appreciate that. And really can't thank you enough for, for being on the show and, and providing all these wonderful insights to the, to the audience members here. If someone does want to contact you and, and, and hear more, we'll obviously tag in the show notes, your books, your website, but which, you know, social media platform or, or how do you prefer to be contacted? 
I'm kind of a contrarian, so I'm not on social media very much, except LinkedIn. You can say hi to me on LinkedIn. I think the best way to start is you can read the book, Turn Words Into Wealth, if you want to take a deep dive into how to use a book to build your brand and your business. It shares seven different uh, blueprints for making seven figures with your your book. Um, Or I have a free book that's available on Amazon, Apple, Kobo, everywhere books are sold called Marketing Fast Track. So that's my gift to the listeners. They don't even have to give me their email address. (laughs) They can just get it wherever they like um, because I have patience because infinite patience produces immediate results. And I have uh, wonderful clients who come to me through, through my books. And if they're interested in doing that, they can sign up for a free business breakthrough call at bookcall.biz or my website, auroraWinter.com. Perfect. Yeah, the Marketing Fast Track, that one will be in the show notes for sure too. I'll put in parentheses there, ebook free download just to signify to you guys that you know which one it is. Um, And yeah, I would say turn words into wealth. Obviously get that one read too. And Aurora, thank you so much for being on. Really appreciate it. such a pleasure. Thanks. 